Am I on? All right. How many are glad you're here tonight? How about how about to your neighbor? Are you uh, glad they're here tonight? Just reach over, tell them, tell them you're glad you're here, even if you're not. Now, here's a more important question. Are they glad that you're here? Now, they may be your husband or wife or your ride here, so they've got to kind of be glad to some degree, but uh, hopefully they're glad otherwise. Hopefully, everyone you encounter today, hopefully the people you pass in the foyer, the people sitting in front of you, maybe sitting behind you, people that you were in class with this morning, people that uh, you just passed by, people you ran into in the parking lot. Are they glad that you were here this morning? Sometimes when we have the greeting time and I'm up here, uh, when I cut you loose to do that, you'll hear me say, uh, who's going to be glad they came because you're here? And it's not because you and I are so great, but it's because every time we come here, we have the uh, opportunity and the responsibility to make sure that others are receiving from God uh, what they need, to make sure they're encouraged and build up. And that's what I wanna talk about uh, just a little bit tonight, making sure that whenever we come together in times like this to worship, to learn, to hear from God, to serve, whatever we do, that we do it in a way that allows others to hear and receive uh, from God. And nothing that we do should distract from that purpose. Now, we're continuing in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, so go ahead and get there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I want you, because we're going to be hopping through this verse by verse, I want you to go and look at it, it'll be up on the screen, but I want us to to go through this together. Now, when Pastor Jeff uh, called me toward the end of the week and asked me if I could cover this, uh, and then I realized we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I I must say I wasn't overwhelmed with enthusiasm, if you know what's in that chapter, because uh, it's not necessarily the stuff of dynamic preaching. Uh, In fact, when I was looking at it, I started gathering thoughts, oh, what do I have to say about this? And I started looking back some notes and things I've written. I actually have a lot of stuff on it to the degree where I thought, man, I better pare this down. And I thought, I'm gonna just make this really practical. And uh, I could do that in about 15 minutes. Well, then Pastor Weaver called me. And uh, Pastor Weaver, uh, you know, he, he was concerned in a passage like you're gonna see tonight that we're dealing with those sticky issues. And so he was giving me some input on that. And so if I go way over, that was all Pastor Weaver stuff because up until he called me, I had about 12 minutes of stuff, I think. But I wanna make sure this passage, there's so much in this book that has been taken out of context, misunderstood, um, all kinds of things that I really wanna make sure that, that we deal with it adequately and thoroughly. And um, I tell you, I was buying a, a new car the other day and I was uh, there, and, and he knew I was a pastor, and he said, what are you preaching about on Sunday? And I'm like, uh, well, what do I say? Speaking in tongues, often you can speak in tongues in the service and that women should be silent. Uh, I didn't quite know how to put that, so uh, we talked a little bit, and I said, there's a lot of things in the Bible that, are, that there's some cultural issues. We need to understand what was going on, but the main thing I want to pull out of this passage tonight Uh, is some very, very practical principles because no matter when we come to Scripture, there is always something relevant to everyday life. And if we aren't careful, we can get so caught up in the details, maybe the specific situations that are going on here, that we miss the big picture. We miss what God is trying to tell us. And there are some underlying principles in this particular passage that not only apply to the specific things they're dealing with, but really apply in general to things that go on every time that we gather together. And that's what I want to do tonight. Because you see, if we don't grasp those big principles, those uh, timeless truths, those those, uh, whys behind the what's, then sometimes we miss what God is really saying and how his word can apply to our everyday lives. And there's a lot of places in scripture that it's real easy to brush over and think, well, this stuff there really doesn't pertain to us. This doesn't come up too often. uh, Or this isn't something we deal with at all. Or this was a whole different setting. And so we just brush over them and we can miss uh, a lot of things. For example, in the Old Testament, uh, it would be really easy to brush over a lot of the genealogies and who begat who and all this. But uh, to really look at that and see that God is saying, I can work through anybody, no matter what their background or who they are, or what they've been through, and I'm working out a plan for you. If we, if we look through the book of Numbers and we see all the tallies and, and, and all of the, uh, the, the things, the inventories that are being taken, 
we can brush over that and our eyes glaze over and we miss the fact that God is working in the details of our life. God cares about every individual. We can look at things like the Old Testament laws about uh, a cleansing and washing bowls and keeping your tent clean. And if you got festering mildew on the walls, you gotta wash it all down. Think, what does that have to do with, with anything until you look at that and realize that God is saying through all that that I care about your well-being in every aspect of your life. I'm taking care of you, I'm looking out for you. And so tonight I wanna look at the underlying principle of a passage. It has a lot of particularly sticky issues. It starts out by talking about speaking in tongues and prophecy and some abuses of that in church and what should be going on and what shouldn't. And then it goes into uh, orderly things in worship. And then at the very end, uh, it gets to the issue of women being silent in church, all kinds of fun stuff. So I'm gonna try to unpack this in a way where we see how all of those um, seemingly maybe obscure, maybe irrelevant issues. We say, well, how often does that come up in this context? And see how they all weave together and they're uh, laying out a very practical principle that goes well beyond the specific issues in this passage to say something to us about every time that we come together here, what type of things should be going on. So that's how I wanna, uh, want to approach it. So uh, if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we gotta understand this whole thing was a, a, a letter, a long letter, and it was uh, written to deal with a lot of very specific uh, issues, particularly issues of behavior that were going on in the church, and, and whether that uh, was individual issues of morality, or uh, being putting aside personal liberties, or using our gifts to uh, help others, or love like we talked about this morning. It all has to do with things that are turning the focus off of us and telling us whenever you come here, your focus needs to be on God and needs to be on others. And so that's what I want to look at this morning. So in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, this morning we covered chapter 13 dealing with love. And before that we got into uh, chapter 12 and some of the other parts that talked about our spiritual gifts and how God has distributed them throughout the church so that we all have a, a part and a place. And now at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he ties those two things of gifts and love together and the very first verse says this. It follow, says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Now, Zach referred to a song this morning. One came to my head. Well, what's love got to do with it? Well, here's the thing. If we truly love people and we're showing love, it's gonna be evident by how focused we are in using what God has given us in our gifts to encourage uh, and uplift others and help them grow closer to him. It's not just about getting the, what we need uh, or doing our thing. You know, a lot of people, they choose where they go to church even by what they're gonna get out of it. What's in this for me? Am I being fed? Am I growing? But the Bible says our focus needs to be outward on others. And that's what it's talking about when it gets even to mentioning the gift of prophecy. Uh, because prophecy simply involved uh, delivering a message aimed at strengthening people's faith and their determination to stay true to God and helping them to avoid some of the pitfalls uh, of going their own way. But uh, prophecy in this sense isn't a prepared message. Uh, it's a spontaneous message that God gives to somebody and they deliver it under the impulse and guidance of the Holy Spirit, but the whole purpose of it is to build the church up and challenge them to respond to his message. But the Corinthians were going about this in a way and they were carrying on in a way that was hindering people from really hearing what God wants to say. And they probably meant well. They were very enthusiastic apparently about the gifts of the Spirit, but they were so focused on certain gifts uh, and trying to be spiritual uh, that what was taking place in their services wasn't being practical or beneficial. In fact, more specifically, what they had really done is they had overestimated the gift of tongues uh, in, the, in the public worship service, and they were emphasizing that at the expense of almost every other gift. Now, that doesn't diminish the gift of tongues because Paul deals with that in most of this book here, and there needs to be a little bit of a distinguishing between uh, when he talks about the gift of tongues and in certain references here and otherwise where it simply talks about speaking in tongues, referring to in our personal prayer times. Either way, it involves the Holy Spirit inspiring a person to speak or to pray or to praise in a way uh, that uh, it happens in a language that we've never learned, that we don't understand, and that was the initial physical evidence when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And the Spirit came on them, and one of the things that happened is they spoke in languages they didn't know. Now at that particular time, there were people present from a lot of different uh, parts of the world 
and they were hearing God's wonders being proclaimed in their message. That was part of what was happening. Now, that didn't happen in every context, but again, there was an issue there of when it was going on in public, there's an element that the message needs to be understood. And Paul distinguishes those things about speaking in tongues and the gift of tongues that's evident in the, uh, in the public gathering. And now, in an ongoing practice in our personal prayer life, uh, Paul talks about speaking that language. He even says, man, I do this more than all of you. And he talks about that and how important it is. And I think there are several reasons why tongues is, is that evidence. We're not going to get into all of that. Uh, but the benefits of speaking in tongues is that when we don't know how to pray when we need to or how we ought to, God's Spirit, if we rely on Him, will literally pray through us. His Spirit back to God, Spirit to Spirit in a way that we don't comprehend, but in a way that's in perfect alignment with God's will and His plans and purposes. So we know that there's a connection there, and we know that God is getting across through that prayer what He wants, even though we may not know how to pray. So He talks about those benefits. But in the sense of this chapter, he's talking mostly about some of the abuses that were going on in the public worship service. And in verse number two, he goes on and says, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Now, there are two ways to understand this verse. It could indicate that uh, the main use of tongues, whether it's in the church or in private, is to speak primarily to God and not to other people. And what is spoken, it refers to uh, as mysteries, things that are understandable to the speakers or the hearers. But Paul is probably also talking to some degree uh, about the fact that only God understands a tongue unless it's interpreted. And he gets into that in just the next few verses that we'll see. The implication being that tongues, when interpreted, are directing to people. And Paul's reasoning for saying that tongue speaking alone is not directed to humans is because nobody understands it unless there's an interpretation of that. But the gift of tongues, as he deals with here, is when somebody is prompted by God's Spirit to deliver a message in public. And that can be a sign, uh, both to believers and unbelievers, as we'll see in just a bit, that something is happening, that God is at work, that spiritual things are taking place. But the whole point is that when it happens in this setting, something else needs to accompany it in order for people to get anything out of it. Uh, and if that gift is legitimately operating, just like God inspires someone to use a gift, he'll inspire someone to interpret that message and make it clear to everybody. And that's why Paul emphasizes the gift of prophecy because in a public worship setting, the gift of prophecy essentially equates to the gift of using tongues and then somebody else interpreting the message so they can understand. Verse number three, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening in courage and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Now that's why he says in the public setting, prophecy, or just speaking out the truth, speaking that word of challenge or inspiration, or sometimes even correction, uh, uh, is of greater value than tongues. It's not that one gift weighs over another, but in the public setting, doing something that's understandable to everybody makes a lot more sense. In verse number five, he said, I would that every one of you would speak in tongues. He's talking about your private prayer time. But I would rather have you prophesy for the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church can be edified. Now, Paul is all for speaking in tongues in, in, in private prayer and worship because it really puts us in union with God and builds our faith in a way that nothing else can. And then he adds that authentic use of the gift of tongues when it's accompanied by interpretation in public worship can do the same for the body. It can build us up as a whole. And it still allows for that to go on. But in this passage, uh, he says it's, it's more significant just to speak words that people can understand. And that's why he kind of elevates prophecy uh, above that and says that if you're going to have speaking in tongues, make sure that it's interpreted. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about what all that means. But he says in verse 6, Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will it be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the pipe or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction uh, in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for the battle? He's simply saying here that any message in public worship, whether it's tongues or otherwise, uh, needs to convey a clear message that's easily identified like that trumpet call that warns people for battle because if the message that gets out is not clear, uh, nobody's going to respond in the way that they could or should. The problem in the Corinthian church 
was that people were getting carried away in their misguided attempt to be spiritual and they were speaking in tongues one after another without waiting until God enabled somebody else to give what would be the interpretation of those tongues to the congregation so that everybody could understand. And Paul tries to correct that abuse by pointing out that speaking in tongues by itself isn't of any value to the congregation as a whole. Verse number nine, so it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of, of what somebody is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. Now, God expects us to use our gifts, and he expects all these gifts he's talking about here to be in operation in the church when we come together. But if we don't communicate in a clear manner, we just end up alienating people instead of bringing them closer to God. And that's what he's talking about by being like foreigners. Verse number 12 says, so it is with you. So you're eager for gifts of the Spirit. They were, they were zealous for them to be used. But try to excel in those gifts that build up the church. In other words, if you want to be used by God, then look for ways to build others up when you're here. Don't just focus on doing your own thing or getting what you can or what you want out of it. That's the whole point uh, of the gifts of the church. That's really the whole point in a large part of 1 Corinthians when it talks about love. Most of what 1 Corinthians is talking about is they were coming together and things were going on during the Lord's Supper, during their services, during other times, how they're dealing with people with moral issues. And a lot of things were just distracting from people receiving the message. And he's trying to say you need to make sure that nothing you're doing in this time together is getting in the way of that message being received and making a real difference in people's lives. Verse number 13 says, For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray then that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I also will sing. With understanding. Now I think here he's talking about both his personal times with God uh, and the times we're together. In personal times, praying in the Spirit on a regular basis will build your faith uh, because it involves speaking on a spiritual level and communicating with God in a way that we couldn't on our own. And when spirit-filled believers use that prayer language, as we refer to it sometimes, uh, it can make their prayers more effective because when we don't have the words, God's spirit will pray through us uh, in ways that are in perfect harmony with God's intentions. But when Paul talks about praying in the spirit and with understanding, he's probably also speaking of times when we come together that whether it's the gift of tongues in operation or we're simply praying and worshiping in our own uh, language, it needs to come from a spirit that's in tune with God. And here's the bottom line. Having faith and exercising our gifts doesn't mean that we don't use reason. And being uh, spiritual doesn't mean that we aren't practical. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Whatever we do for God needs to be personal and profitable for the whole church. And I'll just tell you, the bottom line of all this is getting at the fact, again, that whatever we do here needs to honor God, to bring positive attention to Him, and it needs to build up others. And in just a second, we're going to see that he says, and that needs to be done in a way that's decently and in order so it doesn't distract from those purposes. Look at verse number 16. It says, otherwise, when you are praising God in the Spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving? Since they don't know what you're saying, you are giving thanks well enough, but no one is edified. He's going beyond even the issue of tongues here, and he's making a statement that's saying, even the way you worship, should encourage and inspire others to join in. That doesn't mean that we do it for show or that we aren't sincere in doing it. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Uh, that's part of what he just said there about worshiping spirit and truth. But our worship should be birthed out of a spiritual connection with God and motivated from something within. And if it is that way, it's going to inspire other people to join in with you. I think about this. We all know that if there are people around us who start pressing in with God and it becomes very apparent that, that something is happening, don't we all kind of feel challenged to kind of dig in and go a little bit deeper because we don't want to miss what God has for us? I remember working with youth, there were times that, man, it was like pulling teeth to, to, to get them to, to dig into spiritual things. But there were times when things started to break out with certain individuals and be down at an altar time and it would become apparent that God is doing something here and I would have people come up to me later that I thought weren't into it all and say, well, Pastor Kerry, something's going on here. I don't want to miss what God has for me. It kind of get, gets almost a, a, a holy jealousy. We want to say, I want to be part of that. 
And so there are ways that even we carry uh, on in worship. And when the Spirit really starts to move, as we say, uh, people want to get involved. They want to get immersed in it. So sometimes just a matter of letting ourselves be free in worship. That doesn't mean you have to be outwardly expressive. I'm not necessarily that way. But just being free uh, and, and, and being enthusiastic in worship and really make, making it uh, evident that your intent of focusing on God doesn't matter what else is going on around you, whether it's light, dark, or people are praising or not praising or sitting or standing, or whether the music's loud or soft, that you're getting into it with God. And when that happens, people are challenged and inspired to get into it with you, and all of a sudden, God begins to move uh, in special ways. And it's not that, that that gets God to respond. God is always at work, and he's always active with us, but we just begin to recognize it more. And so even the way we worship uh, can be something that inspires and challenges others to go deeper with God. Now again, Paul emphasized that in his spiritual life, uh, worship and speaking in tongues, and all of these things are an important aspect of spiritual growth. In verse number 18, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues uh, more than you all. So he considered uh, the gift of tongues important, uh, or speaking in tongues important as part of his spiritual life. But the gift of tongues, he gives some direction here as it's used in the, in the congregation. But in the church, I would rather have you speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue, that is, without interpretation. He, he is, reiterates that over and over again. So he's trying to make a clear point here. Again, he's not diminishing the gift of tongues, but simply to say uh, that he spoke more in private times in tongues than he did in public worship, because there he wants to make sure that people understand. So verse number 20 says this, brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. It all boils down, everything that he's saying here, most of the stuff in 1 Corinthians, boils down to an issue of maturity. And here's what maturity looks like in the church. Maturity is when we move from an attitude uh, of what's in it for me? What am I getting out of here? Who said something to me? How am I being fed? All of these things, and our attitude starts to turn to, how can I make sure that the others around me are getting something they need? How can I make sure that they leave feeling more encouraged when they came? How can I use my gifts to make sure that somebody else is uplifted and built up and benefited when I come here? And that's what God wants our focus to be. And that should be evident whenever we come together. Our focus should be on helping others to receive and understand and grow. And every time we're here, we should each of us look for a way to build and encourage someone else. Even if that means breaking our own routine or breaking out of our typical uh, circle of conversation, uh, our friends. Because that maturity shows in a church and it shows when people get it. In fact, that's what he's talking about here in verse number 21 and 22. He's using a contrast to people who never got it, who never received. He said, in the law it is written, with other tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people. But even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So he's talking about, he's kind of making an analogy. He's been talking about tongues. So he pulls from that prophecy in the Old Testament to say, here's a time when people didn't get what was going on. And if we're not exercising maturity and starting to focus beyond ourselves, then no matter how spiritual we seem or what's going on in the service or what gifts seem to be evident, uh, we're not maturing. We're not really accomplishing God's purpose. Verse number 22 says again, tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Now this is kind of strange, so stick with me in this. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. I think this is kind of what he's saying. Speaking in tongues when it's exercised within a church congregation, uh, obviously, even though it's for us, can actually be a sign to unbelievers that something is going on. Something spiritual is happening. There are a lot of things when something, uh, you know, maybe we think is more deeply spiritual goes on. uh, We think it's going to scare people away. And he's definitely cautioning that in here because that's part of what could be happening if they weren't careful. But a lot of times, I remember talking to, uh, to people more about prayer, and sometimes uh, they would think, oh man, you focus too much on prayer and these services that are more geared at, at newcomers and so forth. And I said, listen, there's nothing that speaks more to a newcomer who knows they come in here with needs in their life than when they see something happening and say something's going on with these people. Needs are being met. Something is taking place. So sometimes these deeper spiritual things uh, aren't as off-putting for unbelievers as we think. Now, tongues is something you got to be careful of. Any of you ever uh, seen a guest or invited somebody and the first time they hear somebody gives a message in tongues? It ever happened and you're kind of like, oh man, what are they thinking of this? Most of the time, 
they don't think any more of it than we do. They kind of think, well, you know, that was, I've heard of that, you know. Is that? But a lot of times they realize something spiritual is going on here. I mean, they're with you, they're with other people. They know we're not totally nuts. So they must think we are on to something that they aren't. So they understand something is going on here. They just don't get it. And so in some ways it can be a bit compelling. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they're going to get anything out of it because if we speak in an intelligible way, if somebody has a word to give and they just deliver it in the form of a prophecy, or at least if the tongues are interpreted, then everybody can understand and they can say, man, that really spoke to me. Because sometimes God will use that to speak to unbelievers. But then it goes on to say prophecies, however, is not for the unbelievers or believers. Now that sounds kind of confusing because I would think it'd be the other way around. You know, the tongues is just for us and, and you know, the prophecy in, in an intelligible language is for somebody who doesn't understand. But God is saying, hey, when I'm doing something spiritual, it can be a sign to people that something's going on and that they may not get it. And maybe there's something they need to dig further into. When it says that prophecy is for us, it's simply saying when those challenges go out, uh, most of the time, like the instructions of the word, the correction like this chapter is giving, uh, it's for the church. Some of the times we get more uh, on people outside the church and expect them to be a certain way and realize that most of the challenges in scripture, most of the tough things it says, is the people who are supposed to be God's people, his followers, they're to the church. So when the prophecy goes out, uh, he's speaking to the church who recognize that as a supernatural expression of God's spirit, as evidence that he's at work here. Tongues can also be that kind of a sign uh, that something's being poured out and happening, but again, the message in tongues is not gonna be clear on its own. It has to have something else. Verse number 23, so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, this is what was going on with the Corinthians. And in, uh, in choirs or unbelievers come in, will they not say you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, then they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all. This almost seems to say the opposite of what the verse has just said. There's a little of both going on. Tongues and, and, and ultra spiritual sounding things can be assigned to unbelievers, but for the most part, things need to be intelligible to them. Now, it goes on to say that uh, those things in that prophecy, if it's clear, can speak to even people who are unbelievers, exposing the secrets of their hearts, laying them bare so that they will fall down and worship God, explain, exclaiming, God is really uh, among you. Uh, one of the signs that the Holy Spirit is really at work in a gathering is the ability to expose a person's sin. The Holy Spirit, if he's at work in a congregation, there are gonna be people who are being convicted a work of the Holy Spirit that's convincing them, man, I'm not right with God, and I'm accountable to God, and I need to get right, and that conviction brings them closer, and that's a work of the Spirit, and if that's not happening, if people aren't coming to know God and coming to the point where they see a need to confess their sin and accept his forgiveness and turn their life around or let him turn it around, uh, then God's work is not happening in that place, and that's what Paul wants to make sure that is happening. So again, here's the bottom line in all this, that whenever we come together, we need to make sure that everyone, believers and unbelievers, can hear and receive what they need from God. And he wants to use you and me to do that. So whatever gifts we have, whatever roles we fill, he wants to be, uh, us to be agents of that grace. And nothing that we do should get in the way of that purpose. And that's why he continues in verse 26 to say, what shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction or revelation or tongue or interpretation, Everything must be done so the church can be built up. The Corinthians were wanting to use their gifts and everybody was trying to do their thing and they were doing one after another. But what was happening is they were not focusing on making sure that others were built up. It was just beginning to turn into chaos and confusion and nobody was really getting the point of the message. And he's saying That's, that can't be the way it is. And the underlying principle again in all this is that the purpose for spiritual gifts is to strengthen the church and develop godly character in us and make us more like Christ than like the world. And that happens both in individual Christians as we use that spiritual language in our own time and it happens in the, con in the congregation as we speak in ways that are intelligible to everybody. So he wraps up this whole topic about that with some final instructions uh, kind of on orderly worship and he says in verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, Two or three at the most should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to God himself. In other words, if a person feels prompted to give a message in tongues, uh, they either need to be ready to interpret it or be confident there's somebody here that's gonna do that 
Otherwise, just deliver the message uh, in, in plain English, or the Bible says just pray silently to God yourself. Do that thing, it says it's between you and God. And uh, because there's a lot of times when people might feel that prompting and it's just God moving on them in a certain way, it isn't necessarily for everybody at large. And if that's the case, uh, we need to follow the instructions he gives here. Now, that's all pretty straightforward. Using the gifts, there needs to be order and balance and what comes to the gifts of tongues and prophecy, when those things are in effect, the Bible says we need to reflect and evaluate what's going on. Verse number 29 says, two or three prophets should speak and the other should weigh carefully what's being said. So whether it's a uh, gift of tongues and somebody interprets the message or somebody's just speaking out giving a prophecy, the Bible gives some instruction and says, in other words, don't just automatically accept these things. You need to weigh it out. You need to use discernment. Consider whether it's relevant to what's going on. Consider how it lines up with God's word because we're not talking prophecy that's anywhere on the same level as scripture. Okay, it's not infallible. So we need to say God will never contradict his word. Does it line up with those things? And we weigh it out and we evaluate it. And if it has to do something in the future, we, we don't judge it right away. We see if it happens, it happens, it was true if it doesn't. And if it deals with something right on the spot uh, and it seems relevant, what do we need to do about it? We need to take action, otherwise it does no good either. But the New Testament gift of uh, prophecy is not infallible. It need to be uh, weighed out, and sometimes it needed to be corrected. Now here's, the, I've seen Pastor Weaver do this at times. I, you don't see a lot of people do this. I've heard him at times where he will actually say something, maybe after something was done, and give a little word of guidance, even correction. I think one time I remember, he kind of stopped something and said, I think that's for this time. And I, Very few would ever dare to do that, and I'll tell you why. Most churches and believers get really offended if they get any bit of input or correction on how to use their gifts which is really odd because we should never be so arrogant as I think I just automatically know how to use all these things. It's a learning, a growing process. And uh, as with anything, we, we, we begin to get accustomed. We become uh, more used to doing it. We learn how God really wants to use us. And then we forget that scripture, like this 1 Corinthians 14, a lot of other places, you see people like Paul giving correction and instruction to people they love. God is not mad if you, if the word of a correction is given or guidance or a leader speaks to you or somebody else maybe challenges something. It's going on all over scripture with people who love each other. So we need to be able to uh, accept that kind of correction going on. And we do have control over the gifts. Uh, look what it says uh, in verse number 30. And if a rele rele revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker sh should stop. That should make sense. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. For the spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. Again, when God is moving on you in a special way, you've got control of how you do it, when you do it, if you do it, the tone you do it in. I've heard some messages in congregations that are delivering, delivered like, and thus saith the Lord in such a tone, it seems like God is just ready to bear down on us. And even the tone we delivered in, to be gracious, uh, we have control of that. God gives us the gifts and allows us to use them in those ways as he speaks through us. So we can never use the excuse that, well, that's just God moving. For the spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the congregation of the Lord's people. You see, without some, some semblance of order in the worship service, uh, we don't get much accomplished. So for people who think that we just need to cut loose and let God's spirit do whatever, understand that God's spirit works uh, in an orderly way. But at the same time, we need the balance to say, if God wants to interrupt our best laid plans and do something unexpected, we need to be prepared uh, for him to do that. But whatever happens, he wants to do it in a way that honors him and builds others up. Now, before he concludes this, it touches on, on this last issue that has been so ripped out of context at times and grossly understood and abused in ways that, that have really brought about some destructive theology and it needs to be understood in context, but it addresses a cultural issue that contributes to a lot of confusion and disorder and it was for the, for the Corinthians in their worship. This passage isn't meant to put any restrictions on women in worship. Let's read it in, in verse number 34. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. Now somebody will look at that, see, but he goes back to the Old Testament. It's always been that way. That's not what it's saying. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. 
for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Now, you got to understand this in light of the social order and the, and the customs of the day. And Pastor Weaver referred to this a couple weeks ago. Uh, because the primary concerns stem from the fact that women uh, usually lack the same degree of formal education as men, and as a result, they a lot of times would have questions about some of the philosophical matters and the teaching and instruction that went out, stuff like this, it got kind of deep. And so in the informal context of the, of the early church, when they're just kind of sitting there together, uh, women might have tended to interrupt the service with questions for their husband, or they might have got engaged in kind of side things uh, to themselves, and it just disrupted the church. And it gets back to that same issue that something was going on that was just keeping other people from receiving. And the fact that men and women were a lot of times segregated in worship and kind of one side and the other the way it was a lot of times kind of compounded this problem because if they wanted to ask something, they're kind of calling across. So what is he talking about with this? And it just was a disruption. So this passage isn't meant to imply that women can't uh, speak or be ministers or hold positions of authority in the church because his purpose wasn't to define gender roles for church, worship, or leadership, but to establish and promote orderly worship uh, that didn't distract from people getting message. So the bottom line is this on this particular issue. Women speaking in the church, uh, that issue has nothing to do with what women can or can't or should or shouldn't do. He's simply saying that this cultural thing that you guys have going on here is making it difficult for us to do what we need to in service. It's causing a disruption. And so he instructed them of how to deal with it and how not to deal with it. Because regardless of circumstances or gender or even your gifts, the whole point is that it's not about you. It's about our attitude and attention toward others and making sure that nothing is distracting there. When verse 36 says, did the word of God originate from you, or are you the only people to reach, it's basically saying the message reads it this way. Do you, both men or women, imagine that you are a sacred oracle determining what's right or wrong? In other words, take the focus off yourself. Don't do anything that's distracting to what's going on here. Do you think it even involves uh, around you, 37 and 38, if any of you thinks God has something for you to say or has inspired you to do something, pay close attention to what I've written. This is the way the master wants it. If you won't play by these rules, God can't use you. All right. In other words, if a person or church can't accept these instructions, then basically they're proving that uh, uh, they're neither prophets or people are being used or gifted by the Spirit. Because if you take these things to heart, God wants to use the gifts that he's given to us, but he wants them to be used in a way that builds people up and certainly doesn't distract. Verse number 39 and 40, close the chapter. He says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Okay, he's saying, I'm not saying don't do these things. It's gonna go on here, it happens here. We want the spirit to be free to move. But we could have written this off because I don't even remember a time when it happened three times or more at one time and it going on. And we've never had an issue with women ministering here. So we could have just overlooked this whole chapter and we would have missed this bottom line point. And I'll say it one more time as we close. This is the gist of everything in this chapter and most of 1 Corinthians is that whatever happens when we come together in public worship in a setting like this, it needs to one, honor God, and two, it needs to build up other people. And it needs to be done in a way that doesn't detract from either of those purposes. I used to do, tell people in kind of helping them learn to, to lead worship better, I would say anything that draws attention to itself is out of place in worship. Now that doesn't mean somebody next to you isn't gonna be doing something you're not into and you could easily be distracted by them. But when the focus turns on you and you're more concerned and consumed with what you're getting and doing and doing things your way uh, than you are about what's happening with other people and the fact, can they receive? Can they hear the gift of prophecy? Can they get the message that God wants to get across? Some of these things, you can get lost in a lot of depth of teaching. God is simply saying, I want to deliver a word. Just make sure you don't get in the way of it. That's what he's saying. And if all of us does that, does that and pays attention to this teaching, God can use us in a particular way. Um, I was listening to someone time who kind of put it this way. He said, are you a here I am person or are you a there you are person? There are people who when they come into a room, they're a little bit self-centered, self-focused, maybe the life of the party. And when they come in and when they arrive, it's like here I am. God doesn't necessarily want here I am sort of people. He wants people that come into a place and look for others who may have needs and say, there you are. What is it that you need? Is there, is there something going on with you? Is there something I can do? Can I pray for you? Just to greet, to smile at them, to do whatever. I mentioned it first. Who crossed your path today? Are they glad they came today because you are here? He wants us to be those people who are outward focused 
and making sure that we're here for other people. I want you to stand tonight as we close, and here's how we're gonna, here's how we're gonna do it. I know that was a little different message. Every, every time I preach, I think it's really different. Sometimes I'm all over the place. Sometimes I'm tethered to this. Uh, a couple weeks ago, somebody said they didn't know I was a comedian. Other times, I'm ultra serious. And, you know, but and this was as different as probably anything I've ever preached. I don't think I've ever taken a whole sermon that was kind of more of a teaching and went verse by verse. And so I hope that wasn't bland or dry. Uh, that's just kind of the way the scripture was delivered. You know, Paul was like that. One time, he, he put somebody to sleep and they fell out a window and, uh, and uh, he keeled over. So I hope that didn't happen. And I just kind of deliver it, I think, like, like, uh, like he instructed them. And sometimes that needs to happen. And there's just so much in that chapter. Uh, I want to make sure that we're clear on it. And there's probably a lot more. And in all the words and the quickness of trying to get through it, I might not have said something perfectly. And I'll look back at my notes. And I always say, oh, man, did I say this? Or what did I say there? But just take it to heart and understand. The bottom line is whatever we do here, do it to the glory of God and do it in a way that builds up other people. So here is what we're gonna do. I usually have a prayer time at the end of, all, end of the service, but here's how I wanna end tonight. I just want us to go out, and I want you to make sure before you leave this place, make sure that somebody is encouraged. Make sure that, that somebody is, it, it just uh, give them a, a pleasant smile, give them a greeting, ask what's going on with them. Maybe you can pray with them, see what's going on in their life, and maybe even better yet, I remember as a kid, this was a, this was a great thing. Do this, families, do this for your kids. They'll remember this morning, think about Sunday night. Go out with somebody after, go out to eat, invite them over to your house, get with them, share some fellowship, and make somebody glad that they showed up to church today because you were here. And make sure that every time you come here, whatever you're doing, whatever gift you're using, you're teaching, you're receiving in, just passing people in the foyer, make sure that your focus is on how will somebody else be lifted up and benefited because I'm here. Because I want to make sure that whatever I do allows people to receive, and I don't want to do anything that gets in the way of people receiving the message uh, and the purpose that God has for them. So would you do that tonight? God, as we go, I pray that you would just direct us. We don't ask you to go and bless us whatever way we choose to go, but we want us to look where you're going, to follow in those ways. And Lord, that way is to meet people. I, I so often, I just think when I come into a room that the people you would have gone up to, Jesus, maybe are quite different than what I would have done because you were looking for people. You were looking for needs. You were a there you are type of person and help us to be that way. Even as we go tonight, as we, uh, the people we sat next to, the people we crossed in the foyer, just help us to maybe just enjoy that time of fellowship with some time yet. And Lord, may we be better people for the time we spend together. And we'll give you glory for it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you go and make somebody glad that they were here today because you're here.